Hello, welcome to The Inner. I'm your host, Nelson Castile, and today I have with me Apostle Vincent Poole. Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Hey, Apostle Vincent. Uh, it's great to have you on. Um, introduce yourself. Well, I'm uh, Apostle Vincent Poole. I'm the founding apostle of the Macedonian Call Ministry, presently headquarters in Humble, Texas. Uh, where the Macedonian Call Ministry has been in existence, incorporated in the state of Texas uh, since 1993. And uh, uh, one of our major functions the Lord called us to do is to uh, build up and teach the ministry of the kingdom and sonship. And so that has been our identifying purpose to establish the clarion truth of the kingdom. Okay. So um, how did your relationship with God begin? <laughs> That's an interesting story. You know, uh, I grew up knowing God uh, coming from a background of uh, people that uh, walk with God and love God uh, come from a long line of Baptist preachers. And so it was part of my upbringing. It was as natural to me as doing anything else that I did in my life. And I always had a love for God and a love for God's word. I, I, I tell people all the time, my mother used to sit down and our bedtime stories was that she would read to us from the Bible before we went to bed. Mm. My grandmother, who at that time lived downstairs from us uh, before we actually uh, got our own home, uh, was a great woman of prayer. And I learned the ministry of prayer and the importance of prayer through watching her and being with her. I, I uh, like to tell the story, I was my grandmother's traveling companion. You know, when she never uh, drove, but she walked to the church. So uh, since I lived right upstairs, I became her escort. I, <laughs> I, uh, I went to her, with her, excuse me, to Wednesday night prayer meetings, uh, went to church and Sunday school, BTU, you name it, was part of the choir. I was part of all of the things that uh, were considered uh, the, how do I say it? The uh, characteristics, if you will, of someone who was a good churchgoer. Mm -hmm. But as far as my own walk with God, I would have to say that started many years later. I had an understanding that I didn't realize that I had even at a very young age. I had a deep yearning for knowing more and for understanding more, even though it was not the norm in the denomination that I grew up in. Uh, I was always looking for something beyond what I was hearing. Mm -hmm. And that was instilled in me uh, by Holy Spirit at a young age, even though I didn't even realize it at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of interesting of uh, the turn of events that took me from there to here. And uh, it's quite a quite a long, drawn out story in, in all actuality. Yeah, I could kind of relate to that being in an environment that you knew was close, but wasn't what you were looking for. Mm hmm. Uh, at a young age. <laughs> um, so um, when did your jump from uh, Christianity into the kingdom, when did that happen? That was a progressive journey. Uh, as I said, I had to look back over my life and see the patterns that God had established because I was content, let me say it like that, being a good Baptist 
That's what my family was. You know, my uncle uh, was the pastor of that church. My grandfather had been an associate pastor in the same church. My uncle pastored that church for over 55 years. Uh, and uh, before he died in uh, 2018, he was installed into that church as a pastor in uh, February of 1962. He actually took over the pastorate in December of 1961. And uh, he stepped down uh, in the fall of uh, 2017 uh, and as the past, uh, and they began looking for another pastor at that point. And, then he died the following year uh, in May 2018. But go to back up, you know, I was just in the church. I was, it was a fixture in my life. And the road, I guess, that began my journey is my mother uh, was diagnosed in 1970 with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And she was seeking God, she was pressing in to be healed. And some of our neighbors, uh, the Abbeys, uh, Gala Abbey at that time, uh, told my mother about uh, a lady prophet uh, that had a healing ministry and she was having meetings in her apartment on the south side of Chicago and so my mother yearning to be healed see because my mother was a, a young lady because and at that time I was 15 uh, my mother uh, had me when she was 18 so she was uh, 33 years old when she was diagnosed with arthritis and so she was very young. And so she was desirous of being healed as I alluded to earlier. So she decided she was going to that meeting. And so I went with her. And so we got there and you know, being a Baptist boy, I didn't know nothing about prophets. I didn't know anything, especially about a woman preacher. <laughs> and conducting meetings and being in charge and all of those good things going on. But uh, she was there and there was something uniquely different. Even as a young boy, I knew there was something different about this woman, I, the way she spoke, the, her, the, her mannerisms, you know, every, there was, I had never seen anything or heard anything like the things that I heard that particularly and then she called me out. And when I tell you I was shaking in my boots. <laughs> and and uh, she began to tell me about my life, my history, my background, my family background. And I was like, wow, you know, I was blown away. And uh, then she told me the things that the Lord was going to she began to share with me, I should say, that some of the things that were I was going to uh, encounter on my journey uh, through life. And that uh, began a journey, but it didn't uh, stabilize, let me say it like that, in my life at that time. My mother remembered more than I did. You know, mm -hmm. I was just more in awe and there was a lot of it that I just didn't grasp or hold on to, but I saw them unfold progressively over the years. Um, that was the beginning. And, you know, but I just went back to living my life, you know, being a young man going through, I was a uh, sophomore in high school at that time going through and being and then preparing to go off to college and when i left for college uh, my mother put a bible in my hand and sent me away and uh, that was the beginning of 
my, uh, I guess, plunge into adulthood mm -hmm. from that perspective. Uh, and one of the young men that I met on campus, uh, Vance Jordan, uh, he was uh, from the area. He was from Peoria, Illinois, but he was a young man. He was a little bit older than us. He was 19 at that time. I was 18. And uh, he was a preacher already at that age in the church and down in what's called the Valley in Peoria. Mm -hmm. And I used to go to church with him in Iowa. And, you know, and I saw him on that hand operate from that perspective, but then I saw him on the campus just be himself, be who he was, you know, uh, not having to be the preacher or uh, trying to preach to folks. He just he just was who he was, and his life made a difference, and that uh, made an impact on my life from that point. And but I went on through college and got married and had children and all of those things and still was in church. Uh, hadn't really uh, evolved or developed into those things that uh, had been prophesied to me until I moved to Texas uh, in 1983. And at that point, God began to speak to me. I heard God for myself in January of 1983. He told me about the call on my life and what he was expecting and where he was calling me to. And it made all the difference. I began to garner an understanding. I never told anybody uh, about the conversation that I had with him. I sat down in that apartment and was reading the book of Ecclesiastes and he spoke some things to me concerning myself, my life, where he was taking me. And uh, he reiterated an experience that we had on the road to Texas because we had an accident and uh, the Lord actually sent an angel. I didn't realize it at the time. He told me later to rescue me from a, uh, what could have been a disastrous situation uh, right out between uh, out 59 uh, between uh, Shepherd and Cleveland wow. on the way to Houston. And uh, he began to show me and I began to see my path and see the walk that uh, he had ordained for me, let me say it like that. And so I began to sit down and uh, rigorously study and go through. And the Lord began to heighten my understanding of things. And he began to show me things. And I began to know things and understand things that I had no idea how I knew them, but I knew them. And so for, for that time frame from January to October, it was just me and the Lord. And then he released me to uh, go to a fellowship, found a, a ministry here in Houston, uh, over in near the Hiram Clark area of South Post Stoke that was going through a transition. It started out as Holy Trinity Missionary Baptist Church and it became Holy Trinity Church, Pastor Richard J. Rose, who was going through a transition because he had become spirit field. And, uh. <laughs> and uh, so the Lord allowed him to mentor me from that during that time frame and I became spirit field. I had never understood what that meant before that time. But uh, the things that he began teaching 
and the materials he began sharing, it uh, bolstered what uh, God was saying and doing in my particular uh, situation and circumstances at that time to mm -hmm. heighten uh, my insight and understanding of where God was taking me uh, on this journey with him. Hmm. Wow. Um, so, wow. <laughs> uh, you're a person that is one of the greatest revelators that I know, uh, specifically for this generation. Um, I had Lance on just a bit before you, and he talked about how uh, one of the functions of the apostle is that they're given, uh, I guess you could say, a burden for their generation, a way to reach that specific generation. Um, in your own words, how would you describe the function of apostle? You know, one of the things that I've tried to model in my own life and the ministry that the Lord has given me, I saw the Lord say these things that I do and greater shall ye do because I go to the Father. In other words, my intent was always to deposit everything that God put into me into the lives of those that God brought across my pathway or that God allowed me to pour into and then get out of the way and mm -hmm. allow God to do what he's going to do. My philosophy is this. Uh, uh, the mark of any good teacher is that he or she presses their students to go beyond them. Absolutely. And to me, that's the mark of a good parent. I believe every good parent wants their child to go beyond them mm -hmm. and expand what take and deposit in them and then allow them and hope that they will take that and expand upon it and take it further. And so that's been my whole outlook on dealing with those that God has brought uh, across my path and into the ministry is to pour in and then move. Allow them, God to, and them to operate. Let Allow God to be God in their lives. I, I've been telling several folks and I've been reiterating it in this season more so. I do not want to be a King Isaiah in anybody's life. Mm -hmm. it's, that keeps people blind to God. Mm -hmm. If they're focused on an individual, a ministry, a denomination, or an organization, you won't see God. There's always an obstruction. And I never want to be an obstruction in anybody's life to them seeing God and being all that God has intended for them to be. Mm -hmm. I would hope that what I do would help enhance what God is doing and, uh, and what God wants to do. Let me say it like that in that life, but never to hinder. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, uh, in your own words, how would you uh, how would you define apostle? Just as that, a fathering mm -hmm. sent one to nurture, nourish, to cover, to protect, to help, to mature. Okay. You know, I know that many from this church and religious organization will tell you that the ministry of the apostles to, is to established churches. That is farthest from the truth. Not one of those apostles established a church. Mm -hmm. Paul didn't establish any churches. You know, that's been taught erroneously for years. Mm -hmm. Never established a church. Everything he did was in-house. His ministry was even outside on the street corners, Mars Hill and all of those places. Those were not buildings. And even when he was under arrest, Paul had a house. Mm -hmm. People came to be ministered, to be taught, trained, and developed, and sent back out. He did not establish any permanent 
foundational building as is erroneously taught through the spirit of religion and the structure of the church. Absolutely. That's what I was trying to get you to say. <laughs> there we go. Um, wow. So, um, how, okay. So I guess the way I want to ask this is when it comes to the sonship journey, um, how would you, how do you separate, um, the kingdom of God from Christianity? I just do. <laughs> and they don't mesh. They aren't one and the same. Mm -hmm. They will never come as one. The ministry of the kingdom and sonship will unveil the dominion mandate of creation. The church and Christianity don't have that bloodline. Don't have that DNA. It will never be able to reveal it in its full measure. It can't. Huh. So what would you say the dominion mandate is? What did God say? Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. Where does the word kingdom from come from? Dominion. Mm -hmm. The place of the king's domain. Yes. The sovereignty, the land that the king rules over. And so there is no role of the church in that picture, mm -hmm. in that structure at all. In fact, they have tried to steal an identity that does not belong to the church. Ecclesia is not church. Mm -hmm. Never has been. So there is no teaching and preaching really about any entity called the church. Mm -hmm. In my own studies, I found out that that's something that we actually got, I believe, from King James when he switched the word Ecclesia to the word koinonia in the Bible, where it stopped being a governing body, which is Ecclesia, and became koinonia, which is just people that gather. People that gather. Fellowship. And that's what what we've what we've uh, submitted to. That's what we've come down to. Instead of being ruling and reigning, and that's why our mentality has changed even about the coming of the Lord. He never said he was coming on a rescue mission. He's coming as a king, expecting tribute. He told us to occupy mm -hmm. until he comes. Occupy is a military term. It means to take over. To mm -hmm. rule, reign, set standards, set presidents, set yeah. up his government. Yeah, it's a We're supposed to present that to the returning king, not well in submitting and being subjected to bondage and crying out for him to come deliver us, come rescue us. That's not the picture of sonship. That's the picture of slavery and bondage. Absolutely. So um, what is your encouragement, I guess you could say, for someone who finds themselves, uh, in my words, living in Egypt that wants to make that journey out? And uh, I guess you could say leave the church, leave Christianity, those who want to, those who feel that tug. Uh, what is something that you could share um, to kind of help them out in that transition from church to kingdom or from Christianity to kingdom? It's, it's, it's a hard leap for most people. And so my biggest encouragement is that you get in the face of God and ask him to give you the strategy, the strength, the fortitude, the de divine determination that you stand and know that he has a purpose for you. That there is a unique relationship that he wants to have with you and you alone. You see, when I finally walked away in, from the church structure 
in 98, 99, those. I spent my time locked away with the Lord. You know, at that point in time, my wife was still going to the church that we had been a part of. I walked away. The Lord literally gave me an ultimatum. It's now or never. Mm -hmm. And so I walked away. And I spent my time on those days in the face of God. Locked away by myself. I took up the mantle, the mantra of David. I learned to encourage myself mm -hmm. in the Lord. And that's where I was. And that's where God visited me. And that's where the revelational spout fountain was unlocked, uncorked, if you will. And it began to pour like a river. And I began to see things. And I began to hear things. And he took me completely away from the religious mantra and led me into his timings and seasons. Mm -hmm. From a whole different perspective, he unlocked uh, some things that I would have never heard on the other side. Mm -hmm. He removed the scales and blinders and allowed me to see into the spirit like never before and pull down the revelation that he allows to pour out the things that he allows me to be able to say, to perceive, the perception that he's given me, all of those things. And that that's all God. But it was me having a divine determination to know that there was more than the stale manner that I was being offered in the throes of religion. I knew there was much, much more. And I was, I kept hearing, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be, because what I was seeing was not righteousness. Mm -hmm. And I had to walk away from it. You know, I, uh, when we founded the Macedonian Call Ministries in 1993, I was still a part of a church in the Southwest Houston that was, at that time, it was South Post Oak Baptist Church. But it had gone through a transition and it became Fountain of Praise. But even in that, in 94, the Lord had us start a, a, a church in our home, uh, a, a, a home fellowship. But we had been doing home ministries, home sales since mm -hmm. 1987. God began moving in that direction. And so there were several things that he had began to awaken us to that weren't a part of the norm. And unfortunately, uh, that became uh, a challenge to many ministries that we were having home cell groups and people were being attracted to and people were coming to our meetings. And then they were saying that we were stealing their people and all the different things that went on with that. But uh, no, we encouraged them to go back to their fellowships because we had meetings on Friday nights. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we did not have uh, a Sunday fellowship at that time, but in 94, we did start one in home and uh, so we broke away from all other churches and as far as that going you know I would go and visit some uh, uh, when asked to on occasions but we did that and then uh, and actually in 95 we turned that fellowship over to one of the ministers that helped found it with us because uh, my wife's book was published and we went on the road. She had uh, traveling engagements and she was speaking all across the country. And mm -hmm. I basically was going and, and being with her. And that's what the Lord had me do for 
almost two years mm -hmm. before we came back and reconnected uh, for a season to uh, uh, found the praise. And I, I sat in there for a, a little while, but then I, it just was, there was an unrest in my spirit. And mm -hmm. uh, when we moved away from Southwest Houston and moved up here to the Umbo area, I just didn't go back down there. Mm -hmm. I spent my time myself alone with God. And that was for a couple of years until uh, the turn of the century. And uh, then I, I connected with a ministry called uh, the Foundation of the Apostles and Prophets under Apostle Tim Early and uh, worked with them for a few years going forward. But it's been an interesting journey for me and for the yeah. things that the Lord has said and what we, he's allowed us to see and the places he's allowed us to make deposits in. And, uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. I've basically, uh, what I can tell you, there's, there's been many people that crossed our paths that came in and out of these doors here. And, uh, uh, but we just keep going. We have never stopped. Mm -hmm. And we don't intend to. So it sounds like uh, for those that want to uh, have relationship with God, you'd agree that it's as easy. It's as simple as just uh, setting aside time to allow God to reveal himself to you. I agree. Yeah. The determination must be every individual. Nobody else can make that decision for you. And everybody is not blind to what's going on around them. And there are many that have made that leap of faith that have walked away. And I can say I couldn't have made a better choice than to leave that behind. What would you say are some of your favorite parts about the life that you have now as a son and as a part of the kingdom? <laughs> I enjoy being able to uh, deposit in lives. I enjoy seeing lives develop and grow and expand and increase and multiply. It gives me great joy to see those that God brings across our path or allows us to make some kind of uh, deposit in, really tap into their identity. And as a son, uh, I enjoy the relationship that God trusts me with the revelation that uh, of the kingdom that he's given me. And, you know, and trust me to steward it and uh, stand up and declare it. Mm -hmm. I have made a divine determination, you know, that I will not back up, back down, or back away from that which I am hearing God say for the season. And it doesn't matter to me who doesn't agree with it and who doesn't like it. It is what I've been called to do and is what I will continue to do. So one of the things that you're known for um, is your understanding of the Hebraic, the times, the seasons, the culture, the uh bits of the language um how did you begin to develop that was that something that was purely revelational that was just divine download was it some study and mostly that, divine that was basically it there was yeah i looked at some of the calendar things but most of the things god began to pour into me uh, himself mm -hmm. And it was something that I had not had a personal desire. It wasn't something that I went looking for. It is something that God called me to mm -hmm. and began to 
unlock an understanding because some of the things that he's allowed me to see uh, uh, have, for lack of better terminology, have amazed even me uh, because I know, I told somebody one time, I know that was God. I'm just not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you know, sure, I've gone to college and have a grasp of different things and all of that. But the things I'm talking about that I've been allowed to see and to be, uh, to revelate, uh, that came nowhere from that because I stopped, I got to the point, you know, I have several, several books in this library. I got to the point where I stopped reading, mm -hmm. uh, you know. I stopped using the concordance. I stopped using uh, uh, thesauruses. I stopped using anybody's cliff notes or any mm. of the commentaries. I stopped using any of those things and depended solely on the voice of God. Mm -hmm. And all the revelation that comes forth comes from that place of relational uh, positioning. Yeah. So for those of you who want a greater understanding of the Hebraic, I have yet found no better teacher than Apostle Poole. Um, his book, uh, <laughs> Understanding the Biblical Calendar, you can find it on Amazon, is the best book on the Hebraic calendar that I found. And I'm somebody that's looked in a lot of places. I found some books and a lot of books will just give you the facts and the information, but very few actually give you the, uh, as some would say, behind the veil, deep revelation uh, accompanied with them. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, I highly recommend that book. Um, and I'm not just saying that because he's my grandpa. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. How would you... Uh, how would you separate? How would you separate uh, being a child of God versus being a son of God? The maturing process. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the difference between the church and the kingdom. One of them that I want to point out, you join the church, you're born into the kingdom. And see, there. God never told you to join anything. Mm -hmm. He called you as part of the body. Your body does not join. It's fitly joined together. But, you know, when you come into these churches, they'll tell you all first time visitors stand up. Well, you don't visit your body. Mm -hmm. Your hand doesn't visit your feet. It's a mm -hmm. part. Yes. So, that's a disconnection. That's not a connection. That's not really giving you the, the spirit of unity or the unity of the spirit. However you want to look at that. There are things that God wants to unveil in this season and it will only come into manifestation through the revelational grasping of the kingdom mandate of eternity. I like the way you put that. Um, so uh, we talk, me and you both talk a lot about having a relationship with God. Um, <laughs> how do you think that even though like you and I both know that relationship with God was why we were created and has always been God's plan for us. Uh, what do you credit to the, I guess you could say, the delusion, the disconnect that we now live in that's more so the standard where God's this faraway person that doesn't like us? Where do you think uh, or do you believe that ideology, that separation came in? Uh, that separation to me was a plot, a plan, and a ploy that came through Rome because you had to separate God from the people in order for you to become the mediator. See, mm -hmm. the, what we, most people fail to realize and, and, and understand that Constantine created Christianity to 
strengthen and enhance his own position in the empire of Rome. But yet, what again, what most folks don't understand is the Roman constitution said that if uh, the emperor made any particular religion, the religion of the empire, he became the head of it. Mm -hmm. So he had to separate and distance the people from God so that he could be the in-between, the Mm -hmm. go-between. They had to come through him. So he established a perverse priesthood, hirelings, the perfect example of hirelings those that had no relationship with God and had no concern for the people. They were just getting paid. And so they had no understanding of what they were doing, but they were the go-between. They set themselves up, even though the Lord died. And again, uh, the first thing that was highlighted in the death of our Lord was that the veil in the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. giving us direct access to the presence of God. Every individual on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Direct access to God with no middleman. Rome comes along, changes that whole scenario, Mm -hmm. closes that up. You no longer have direct access with God. You got to go through this buffer. And so God became way up here. You became way down here. And here was the the Roman priesthood and Constantine right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And that's the pattern that we follow, promoted and propagated down through the centuries. Yeah. So you do agree with the statement that uh, a face-to-face or audible relationship with God is something that we're supposed to have and that God actually wants us to have. Absolutely. That was the pattern of creation itself. Adam walked in the garden in the cool of the evening with the voice of God. Mm -hmm. Direct access, direct encounter, consistent communication. That was God's pattern. And he continued to say that today, if you hear my voice, not yesterday, not the, today. Harden not in your hearts as in the day of provocation in the wilderness. Yeah. Uh, in conversations before that we've had, you've mentioned the uh, example of Moses and the people that were invited up. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. God said to Moses, he said, go Prepare this people. Have them cleanse their selves, cleanse their garments, and come meet me. That invitation was not just to Moses. Mm-hmm. It was to the entire nation that God has separated and singled out that was to become the expression of his life in the earth. Israel was considered God's prized possession. Israel had sonship in their DNA, the name Israel. Jacob transitioned into Israel. Jacob being the man of the flesh, Israel being the man of the spirit, Israel, God's prince, prince of God. The prince is what? Simply the son of the king. Mm -hmm. So they had sonship in their DNA. So God was going to take his sons. That was the call. That's what he said through the prophet. Hosea 11 and 1, he said, when Israel was a child, I loved him. Mm -hmm. You asked about a child of God? He was a child, I loved him. But Mm -hmm. out of Egypt have I called my son. The matured ones that are going to come and be the expression, the reflection of me. So God said, come meet me. I got somewhat to say to you. I want to reveal myself. I want to uh, really tell you who you are, show you who you are. So they, they got excited. They followed all the instructions, got ready to go. Then they heard the thunder, saw the lightning, and got scared. (laughs) They said, hey, Moses, you go meet God. Mm -hmm. You hear from God, and we'll hear from you. That's not what God said. Mm -hmm. God told them all to come meet him. 
He wanted to pour into all. See, that's what James came back and caught that revelation. He said, if any man lack wisdom, what? Let him ask of God. Any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who give it to who? all men. Not a select few, not some men, all men in liberality and upbraid is not. So God had determined to speak to a nation of people who he, who he had designated as a kingdom of priests. There's that kingdom, a kingdom of priests. A nation of slaves was transitionally transformed into a kingdom of priests, yet they never embraced the fullness of that identity. Wow. That's something heavy. Anybody that actually heard that through sonship got something. <laughs> People who didn't might have just got mad. But <laughs> um, so uh, right now, God is doing a lot of amazing things. He's moving us around. Uh, what are some things that you can see that God is working on at the moment? What are some things that are being released in this time period? God is releasing a people that will dare to hear him. And there is an exodus. We're having another exodus, whether people realize that, whether they want to admit that or embrace that. There is a divine awakening in this season. And there is this is a season of the Gideons and the Jeremiah's. Mm. And this is a season of deconstruct to reconstruct. Mm -hmm. God is tearing down that old wineskin mentality. And here he's given us the revelational insight of the new wineskin of the kingdom. And literally we're becoming a people that are being formed into a new wineskin. Mm -hmm. And that's where God is calling those who have a circumcised ear to hear what the spirit is saying to the ecclesia or to the mature sons wow. in this season. So you and I recently worked on a project together. Um, it was your mandate uh, and I came and helped you with it, um, which was the remantling of Houston. Um could you talk about that process of uh, your connection to William Seymour and the uh, what just took place in Houston? That was a continuation of an assignment that the Lord gave this ministry. One of the things that the Lord said to us uh, 10 years ago in this particular ministry said that we would... Uh, recover or rediscover, recover, restore, and redistribute uh, mantles. And he sent us on a journey uh, seeking the uncovering of the mantle of William Seymour because God sent William Seymour to Houston the movement that became known worldwide and historically as the Azusa Street uh, revival was initially, originally targeted for Houston. God sent William Seymour here. He's mm -hmm. from Louisiana. God sent him here to Houston to uh, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and there was downtown Houston there's an Annunciation Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, down there, there was a group headed by uh, a white brother by the name of Charles Parham, who had the School of the Holy Spirit. William Seymour had such a hunger for the baptism of the Holy Spirit that he traveled to Houston and came to that school and because of the racial climate of the time, this was 1906, uh, they would not allow the brother to sit in the classroom with his white brother, but he refused to be denied. He sat outside the window mm -hmm. uh, of the classroom and 
listen. Because one of the other phenomenal things is uh, about Seymour is he was illiterate. Mm -hmm. He couldn't read or write. And so uh, the anointing and the preaching that he did was all through what God was pouring into his spirit revelationally. It wasn't anything that he wrote in notes or anything that he read out of the Bible. It was mm -hmm. all through a relational, experiential relationship, let me say it like that, with God. So the Holy Spirit fell outside the classroom, outside the window. So he, refu he received the power and he mm -hmm. began to preach in the surrounding area. And he began to draw, uh, drawing people uh, to that hunger for God, to that hunger for the baptism of Holy Spirit. And then he was ushered out of town. And so he ended up in L.A. And uh, ended up having meetings in the Bonnie Bray house. And that, mm -hmm. those meetings became so large that the house could no longer... Uh, contained them. And so uh, there were several things that went on. The, the fire department was called on several occasions because they thought the house was on fire. The roof looked for miles around. People saw flames shooting out from the roof and they thought the house was on fire. It was the power of the Holy Ghost. And so people were all out in the streets coming. They There were so many people, they collapsed the uh, the porch of the house. And so uh, Biddy Mason, the mother of C.H. Uh, Mason, had a livery stable down on Azusa Street there in L.A. And she gave them that building to have their meetings. And those meetings went on for about nine years. And anyway, the Lord said that mantle was, his mindset had not changed about uh, Houston. So we went to, to, L.A., we went to the Bonnie Bray House. We went to Azusa Street. There even was a memorial we visited that wasn't part of our in, intended uh, places of visitation when we planned out the trip, but there was a Biddy Mason memorial. She, she was a phenomenal woman herself. Mm -hmm. She had an uh, unusual story. Uh, it, it would take some time to go into that, but we, we went there. And then God sent us into Louisiana and uh, into Seymour's hometown. We went there and God gave us several prophetic art, acts to perform and, and pick that and bring those that mantle back to Houston. And then he said it was time to uh, revive and resurrect that which we had deposited in the ground there. And then uh, uh, you and the rest of the group of us that went down there uh, on those two days that God had us go and, and visit uh, down to the Annunciation Park and, 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 and listen for the instructions. There's an awakening because Houston is positioned to be uh, a central figurehead, if you will, a, a central launching point of uh, this kingdom move of this 21st century. And so that mantle had to be uh, again uh, highlighted and released over the city. Because see, there, there, there are several things that Houston represents in you know, the, the energy corridor, the space system, the medical center, and, and the financial center, there, there is the, the holistic expression of the dynamics of kingdom life that are uh, relevant. And they're right here. Houston's identity expresses the fullness of it. Mm hmm yeah, one of the things that fascinated me when we went out there, I believe that was for Pentecost, um, 
was that it seems as though Houston built itself around the spot where William Seymour received the baptism of the spirit. Uh, I believe that was the courthouse on one side. There was the fine art school on the other side. There's something important. And it seems like Houston kind of just built itself up from there. Yeah, there's a there's a Texas courthouse, as you were just mentioning. There's the city hall mm -hmm. of Houston itself, the government. There's the financial center, banking, and then the fine arts, the four mm -hmm. sides of that Annunciation Park where the school of the Holy Spirit was right there in, in the center of it. And it's it's amazing that it's all there. And and it built outward from there. So um some time ago, you and I were in the spirit, and you actually had somewhat of a dialogue with William Seymour. Do you remember uh, or could you give somewhat of a synopsis on what he told you about Houston? It just talked about just that, that God had not changed his mind and yet Houston is going to be in the forefront, in the center of what God is doing in this next kingdom movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and around that time, we started seeing uh, a lot of people feel the move to come to Houston. Yeah, both divinely and of their own uh, accord. <laughs> That's we right. started seeing uh, an attraction to Houston once again. There are those that have come and they've come illegally. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I actually addressed one and, and sent a note because they're trying to usurp what God has actually said over this city. And they're trying to take control of it. And it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So William Seymour ended up in California uh, in simple terms, just due to racism. They didn't want him where he was, so they shipped him somewhere else. Uh, how big of a role would you say that racism is played in the moves of God or the failure of a move of God to continue? Unfortunately, it has been uh, quite uh, prominent and it really uh, displeases the heart of God. It saddens the heart of God that people fall that are supposed to be worshiping God, that are supposed to love God, mm -hmm. fall into those things and and actually operate out of those spirits. Yeah. And then expect to walk in the anointing and be able to uh, express the heart of God. And it's just an impossibility. Mm -hmm. It's just an impossibility. And that has stagnated many moves that... God actually wanted to uh, ignite in many of the regions, but people can't see beyond uh, their cultures or their skin. And mm -hmm. that's a sad estate for those that say they love God. Yeah. How many, like, I, it just makes me think how much if we missed due to that how many moves of god happened that were actually the third or fourth uh, attempt that finally started moving when god wanted something done somewhere else i don't think william was the first time that happened where a move of god was intended for one place but was rerouted um and i won't just say for racism even though racism did play a huge role in that but for many different reasons, a move of God ended up either not happening, uh, dying prematurely, or uh, ended up happening somewhere it was never intended for. Uh, that's something that I ponder on from time to time. Uh, it kind of reminds me of Catherine Kuhlman, where she says that she doesn't think that she was the first person that God reached out to, nor did she think she was the second. I think she said she thinks she was like the the 10th or 11th person that God uh, reached out to. And she just said, yes. Um, 
we're all, we're getting a little uh we've been going on for some time um what are some things that um let's see i might have asked you this already yeah um somewhat closing what is something that you feel like you could uh just uh exhort to the people at this time what is uh what are some things that you know that uh would stir up the people for the things that God is having, uh, that the things that God is awakening at this time. One of the things that I'd like to encourage people in is this is a perfect time to recover yourself. Find your voice, find your identity, find your purpose, find your reason for being. Your life has meaning, but that meaning can only be found in God. So again, I would encourage you to get in the face of God. It's not about asking someone else to define you for you. You can only get the true definition of you from God the Father. So that is the place that you're going to have to get into to recover you. I know that Buddhists somewhat teach that um, in order to know anyone else or anything else, you have to first know yourself. We happen to be on the opposite side of that spectrum where we, I believe you would agree with the statement that in order to know yourself, you have to first know God. Absolutely. Uh, considering he's the blueprint that we were created from. We're the only thing that was made as his with himself as the blueprint. Um, speaking of that, um, before we go, how did you come into the revelation of the feminine nature of Holy Spirit, the uh, feminine voice of the kingdom? Another thing, like I, everything came to me from revelation. God pointed out to me long time ago, he said, look at my name, El Shaddai, the all-breasted one, the all-nourishing one, the God who is more than enough, the almighty God. And then he began to take me back to the revelational insight that the original Hebrews had no problem with that. If you look at the writings of Solomon, he identified the spirit of wisdom and understanding as she. He had no problem. And the word Shekinah is feminine. The mm -hmm. word that we say, Ruach, it's Ruaka. It's feminine. Yeah. And then God just began to show me little glimpses and patterns, you know, of things that would point out. See, because our scripture says first natural, and then spiritual, and then we try to uh, process that from our Western cultural thinking. But what it actually means Hebraically is everything that manifests in the natural has a spiritual counterpart. So the simplest process of that is where is the expression of the female in the Godhead? Mm -hmm. In order to bring forth offspring or to reproduce, you have to have a male, a female, coming together as one. Absolutely. Uh, that's even seen in the creation of mankind, is that since man was created from God's image, and then God separated uh, Adam into male and female, the question arrives, where did female come from if God is a fully masculine entity? Answer is he's not. God is not a fully masculine entity. It's not three guys working together. It's a family. It's a father. It's a mother. It's their son. <laughs> Which is something that's also revealed in the play out of Genesis. You see the masculine and the feminine taking form as the uh, male Adam and the female Adam. 
who exactly. were eventually known as Adam and Eve after the fall. After the fall. And that's what we, we don't teach properly. We keep wanting to tell the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. There was no Eve in the garden. Mm -hmm. And Genesis 5 gives a revelation of that. And it talks about these are the generations of Adam in the day God created. It said male and female created he them. And they were called Adam. Mm -hmm. Not he was called Adam. God never addressed the woman as Eve. Not one time. It was after the fall, after sin entered in, it said Adam called the name of his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. So we have not revelationally taught the fullness of the identity of mankind. Yeah. So therefore, we don't understand the fullness of the identity of the Godhead. Yes. I've heard it said, and this became one of my favorite quotes, that when uh, children have uh, daddy issues, they tend to be people pleasers. But when people have mother issues, they tend to become sociopaths. Uh, in other words, when you have issues with your father, you become mindless. When you have issues with your mother, you become heartless. Uh I often accredit the current state of the body of Christ to being that of a sociopath because they haven't yet embraced their mother. They've never engaged with Holy Spirit as the true divine feminine. Therefore, it left the void. And that seems to be the pitfall that we keep falling in. We fail in the areas where our mother, who is the original priest, would have uh, filled that gap. That's when you why talk about possible. a comforter and a nurturer. Yes. Why does that not give you the picture of the feminine? Yes. <laughs> it's like that's why it's possible to have issues uh, like racism or sexism or any areas of prejudice against one another. Because we have not yet adopted the heart of our mother. We've only at most adopted the mentality of our father, which stands for justice and order. Which is why we sometimes a lot of our structures are built on authoritarian rule. That's not balanced by a compassionate heart. Because <laughs> we haven't had collectively we haven't had the experience of both for some they only know god as a masculine authoritative force therefore they can't release anything else and that's something that i believe is going to become more and more prevalent that people are going to begin to embrace uh all sides of the godhead all parts of our identity which will then fill those voids um, so let's see, uh, we're getting, we're going to have to close soon. Um, Apostle Vincent, thank you <laughs> for, uh, helping me out tonight. Um, you've shared some things, you've shared some wonderful things that if people listen, um, they'll be able to receive. And we said a lot that some people might not like, but if they listen to it with God and allow God to process the information, it'll help them too. Um, if you would, could you release a blessing over the people that would listen to this or see this? Father, tonight, I just thank you for those that are hearing this live and those that will hear this by replay. And I pray that there would be an awakening, an unlocking of mindsets, an unlocking of revelational insight. An unstopping of ears and an increase and in multiplication and an expansion of desire to know themselves, but first and foremost to know you. I want to speak into their spirits that they hear 
resonating. This particular voice, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And then also, Father, I'm hearing this. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Will give it to all men, all men, in liberality, and upbraideth not. Help us to understand that you were there and are there all the time. As the eternal father, but as the wayward son, there must be a coming to ourselves, even as the one that we called prodigal, who said, "I." when he came to himself, he said, I will arise and go to my father. Father, let them know that this is a season of divine recovery and divine restoration for your glory. Amen. Amen. All right. So where can people find you? You can find me on Facebook at Vincent Poole, uh, which is probably the easiest for most people that utilize that platform. You can also find me at Apostle Poole, no E on the pool, at msn.com. You can find us at www.macedonian, M-A-C-E-D-O-N-I-A-N, call, C-A-L-L, dot org. Love to hear from you. Uh, correspond with you from those places. If you are, are interested in the book that uh, Nelson showed and talked about earlier, my book, uh, if you inbox me, you can get a signed copy directly from me. Otherwise, you can purchase it uh, on Amazon in either Kindle or paperback. Mm -hmm. I always uh, allow people to uh, know that the Kindle version does not have the prophetic pictures and the Hebraic language is very uh, visual. It's picturesque. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you get an expanded understanding from the prophetic pictures concerning the times and the seasons of God. We're going to have to understand that your actual scriptures were written around the timings and seasons of God. So, if you're feeling out of sync or off kilter, that's because we're trying to force God's scripture to fit into Rome's calendar. God has his own calendar. Mm -hmm. He has never changed it. He has never given anyone permission to change it. He still mm -hmm. operates according to his calendar and that scriptures evolve and revolve around God's feast time. And they are the Lord's feast. They are not the Jewish feast. They are the Feast of the Lord. Uh, you can find all of that information in Leviticus 23. They were established before there was any such thing as a Jew. You mm -hmm. need to understand that. God take, took ownership of those feasts, and they are eternal. They are not temporal. And so uh, those things are necessary. The life of the Lord revolved around God's feast. He was the expression of the feast, even the design of the temple. And there is great revelational insight in garnering that divine understanding. Amen? Awesome. All right. So that's going to be it for this session. Um, yeah. So that concludes this session of The Inner. Um, more will come in the future, but for now, that's all. Um, be blessed. <laughs>